This is the American Law Journal. Just about all of us know the lurid details behind the Penn State scandal, but ultimately, who is going to take the fall, at least legally? Good evening, I'm Christopher Norton. Tonight, we'll take a look at who might be civilly liable in this Penn State mess and how might these instances affect the mandatory reporting of child abuse in Pennsylvania and nationally. But before we tackle that, we want to take a look at a very curious legal strategy. Why would an accused sex offender and his lawyer first try their case in the media? Trending News Channel and CNN give us this. The web is buzzing over Bob Costas's telephone interview with Jerry Sandusky. Speaking for the first time since his arrest on 40 counts of sex abuse against underage boys over a 15 year period, the former Penn State assistant football coach declared his innocence. In a segment on NBC's Rock Center, Sandusky admitted to horseplay and showering with kids after workouts, but insisted he is not a pedophile. Perhaps the strangest part of the interview came when Costas asked Sandusky if he was sexually attracted to young boys. Am I sexually attracted to yes. underage boys? Sexually attracted? You know, no, I, I enjoy young people. I, I love to be around them. Um, I, I, but no, I'm not sexually attracted to young boys. Sandusky's attorney, Joe Amendola, is also making the interview rounds, maintaining his client's innocence and describing him as an overgrown kid. Sandusky is a big overgrown kid. Uh, he's, a, he's a jock. Uh, for anybody who's ever played sports, you get showers after you work out. I mean, when people hear he got showers with kids, oh my goodness, you know, like he got showers with kids. But, but, but that's a far different thing than saying he got showers with kids than saying that he committed these other acts, which the prosecution has alleged he did. I mean, what's going to come out in this case is that Jerry did get showers with kids. What I think happened, what I'm being told happened, is that Jerry was in the shower with this kid. The kid was messing around, having a good time. You had McQuarrie come in and see that. He felt uncomfortable, which is exactly what Curley and Schultz are saying, that it was reported to them by McQuarrie that he saw Sandusky in a shower with a kid, and he felt uncomfortable. And... Two of the cases, two of the more serious allegations, they don't even have victims. Uh, they don't even have people who are saying that this is what happened. They have other people who are saying they saw something, but they don't have actual people who said, this is what Jerry did to me. Uh, we're working on finding those people. And uh, when the time comes, and if we were able to do that, we think this whole case will change dramatically. Why do you think these pieces started oddly uh, in this instance? Uh, again, someone going before the media, trying the case in the media. I'm going to go around the panel and ask my four guests what they think about that. We'll also address some of the civil issues that you may not be seeing on some of the other networks when it comes to Penn State and some of the other people involved here. And then finally, let's talk about how mandatory reporting laws may change in the state of Pennsylvania and maybe across the country. The Honorable Jack Pinella is with us tonight. He is with the Pennsylvania Superior Court. That's the appellate court. He's also the author of the Pennsylvania Sexual Violence Bench Book. Frank Cervone joins us this evening and he is with the Support Center for Child Advocates in Philadelphia. He is their executive director. Steve Scheller is with us, a plaintiff's attorney in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania with Scheller PC not only known for his uh, civil litigation work, but he's also served on the Board of Trustees at Penn State at one time and now at Drexel University. And Gene Cohen joins us tonight, uh, pinch hitting judge. I know you don't mind hearing this, but uh, we know that corporate counsel was supposed to be here tonight. He was conflicted out at the very last minute, but you're there with Montgomery McCracken and uh, certainly your background, I think, warrants uh, having you here with us tonight. So thanks for joining us, especially at the last moment. Folks, we're taking your telephone calls tonight, 1-800-426-4625. Email us at info at lawjournaltv.com. Judge, what kind of attorney allows an individual to speak to the media when they've been accused of child molestation and the lawyer himself goes on the air? Mm. 
Chris, that's a very good question. Um, as we all know, I'm not allowed to make any comments about pending or potential litigation, sure. uh, especially the Penn State matter. Right, it's hypothetical. I, I don't mind telling you uh, about a situation which I experienced as a trial judge. It's in my book, in which an attorney permitted his client, his client had been uh, charged with child sexual abuse, mm -hmm. to be not only interviewed by the police, but the interview to be recorded. And then later that was played at the time of trial. Evidence, of course, is ad admitted pursuant to the rules of evidence. This w that way, the attorney got his client's message to the jury, but his client was not cross-examined, was not subject to cross-examination, didn't have to take the stand. Uh, has no applicability to what's happening right now at Penn State, but it's just a situation where an attorney made a decision to All do All right, something. so the story gets out, but the individual doesn't have to take the stand. It's not like, in some ways, O.J. Simpson. Uh, you know, he, he got his message out through the press. His attorneys got the message out. He never intended to appear at trial. I'm sure the same thing is true here with San Sandusky. Yeah, I'm sure that was true. The problem here is the attorney may have put his client's chin out because there was a much more recent event of a young person who was in 2008 and 2009 who came forward with his mother and made it very, very clear, very serious allegations. And uh, when the attorney makes a claim that none of this is true and you have this much more recent event going on, which hasn't been talked about, frankly, that much, but is thoroughly discussed in the grand jury report. The other thing I'm particularly disturbed about on this whole situation is why wasn't there an arrest made when that young man came forward and we would have stopped this guy from doing what he was doing. It's very disturbing to me that the attorney general at the time didn't make an immediate arrest. Frank, uh, from what I've heard, uh, it was really two women, two mothers who got the ball rolling here. Uh, pretty dam damning statement about, uh, about some of our institutions and maybe about police work here as well. Sure, the, the first mother's involved in the case 15 years ago and uh, her son comes home with wet hair. He tells uh, his mom, I had a shower with the coach and of course she is alarmed. Uh, let's the authorities know about it, and an investigation follows that goes nowhere. And you know that ending is often t is typical for our, our work. Uh, one might say it's hard. To, these are hard cases to make. Uh, as the judge suggested, there is this exchange in the shower. We don't know how culpable it is when it's standing alone as an event. This event and the others now stand. Uh, you know, among eight kids, 50 or more incidents are reported. I think the other significant factor is that uh, when he goes on and makes his statement uh, to the public and to the nation, mm -hmm. he kind of kicks the rest of his potential, his victims, in the teeth. We have to imagine if there were indeed eight victims, mm -hmm. that there are others out there. And that's certainly what the grand jury asserts. Well, the the uh, speaking out like that is normally ahead, a, you know, is normally a strategy. Uh, when uh, the uh, defendant does not intend to s testify at trial and tries to put out a uh, spin on his own conduct. And under the circumstances, it didn't sound terribly credible. But, in, in, but it could have been, and maybe that was with the original strategy, and it didn't come out quite what the, like, the attorney wanted it to. But, Judge, isn't it a bit of a Hail Mary pass? I mean, I'm, certainly the lawyer assesses the case. It's, it's, looking, you know, it's looking bad for his client right now. Uh, he maybe figures there's not, not a whole lot to lose. Well, where are we going to find a jury that hasn't heard about this case? Well, that's precisely why he got out there. Yeah. But part of the problem is that this all becomes part, you know, th this all filters through uh, to the public and anyone who is going to be a member of that jury pool probably finds out more about Sandusky, f finds out about his attorney who had his own uh, problem with uh, underage children back in the 1990s. And I'm thinking, you look at the Cochran team getting O.J. Simpson off in the mid-1990s, uh, Judge Cohen, do you think that there's any daylight here right now? This is not the kind of case that you'd like to be handling. I'm just speaking about from a legal standpoint, not from a moral one. Well, the, the, from a legal standpoint, it sounds to me that many of the witnesses will be uncorroborated and they'll be, their testimony and their credibility will be at issue. Uh, so under the circumstances, uh, the more uh, the lawyer becomes a celebrity personality himself, the more credibility he may have uh, with the jury, just like the, uh, they did at the O.J. Simpson. The, the lawyers became celebrities during the course of the trial. Right. 
and uh, but but of but of course, uh, celebrity. How does that help? How does that help? Uh, except when you're in front of the jury. Well, that's really where the ultimate conclusions are going to be made. I'm sure. Let's take a look at some of the people here who might be on the hook. Some of those folks who were. Uh, brought up specifically in the in the grand jury report. Of course, everyone's heard of Jerry Sandusky now, but some other folks, Graham Spanier, the former president at Penn State, Tim Curley, Penn State athletic director, uh, Gary Schultz, the senior vice president for business and finance, Joe Paterno, quite possibly. He just went out and got himself uh, a, a criminal defense attorney. And Mike McQuarrie, and I don't know what kind of deal McQuarrie may have cut here, and we don't we really don't know that right now. But Steve, I mean, at least six people might be on the on the hook here, yeah. civilly and criminally, oh, yeah. the, the, and that could impact the case against Penn State. At yeah, large. the disturbing thing about this, and you know, being on the board of trustees at Penn State back some years ago, and now being on a, uh, the board of Drexel University, Drexel has gone out of its way previously to make certain this kind of problem is dealt with by establishing a center for corporate responsibility. Uh, and they have a very fine professor running it. And uh, this is one of the real serious problems in education today. Our system of uh, higher education, uh, the morality and the ethics need to be much more carefully investigated and improved. Uh, the whole idea of protecting the university's reputation at the expense of allowing uh, children to be sexually uh, molested and raped is indeed disturbing, but this goes far beyond this. This goes into the area of universities using ghost writing because they get uh, grants, such as Harvard with uh, Risperdal. Uh, th this is disturbing to me. They get, they're more interested sometimes in raising money than protecting the public from injuries, from drug products, from uh, sexual molesters. Mm -hmm. Uh, th and that's why Drexel has a, uh, actually a very good thing that they've established this uh, uh, institution with that in Drexel to examine it and come up for ways of solving these problems so it doesn't continue. And I, that's one of the things that I hope comes out of it, that we don't just focus on this investigation and neglect what happened at Penn State with the president, the vice president, the athletic director, the football coach. This is an infectious disease that's going on in our education systems. And, and Judge, one of the ways that we, we sometimes write the boat in our society is not simply to take criminal action occasionally, quite often with uh, criminal actions thereafter, there's a civil uh, cause of action here. Um, institutions are on the hook if one of their agents or representatives acts on behalf of that institution. But what happens when someone acts criminally? How do you impute criminal action to an organization, to an institution, to a corporation. I'm going to have to take a pass on that. It's okay. a little too right. close well, to the situation. <laughs> yeah. we not, we, we we'll, let, we'll let Steve in All right. on that. Uh, <laughs> well, there could be a quo orano proceeding, but I don't think that that's the case here. Uh, the, the, if, if a, an individual acts, uh, uh, there's a degree of criminality on the part of an individual, even though he has the best interest of the institution at heart, that that accrues to him alone at that time, the institution may be civilly liable or may even be fined if they're charged. You can charge a corporation with a crime. Uh, the difficulty is you usually don't put anybody in jail. It's just a question of money. Look, I think that the real question here um, is what duty these folks had to respond? Mm -hmm. What legal duty, what moral duty? Uh, all of us who work with kids know that we are mandated reporters under the law. Um, it's a broad circle, it's a low bar. We, if you come in contact with kids in your job, and so the grand jury identifies a janitor who came upon an incident. He was a mandated reporter. He clearly had no responsibility for the care of kids. Coach McQuarrie, you know, he's working with, the, with college students on the football team. But because he comes into contact with children in his job, he was a mandated reporter. And then up the chain of command it goes. Once they told their boss, their boss wears that same duty of responsibility, that duty to report. That's the legal construct we're talking about. And it's a, it's a, it's a broad uh, circle, and it's broad, and it's a big circle because of it, we want it to be a protective circle. We want kids to have adults in their lives who step up for them. And, you know, quite frankly, 
a host of people in this community fail to respond. And I don't think it's Penn State alone in doing this. We've talked about universities. Institutions in general tend to work this way. They close ranks either by loyalty or fear or, um, in a sense, the, the, the pressure of, uh, of the potential for scandal. But all the people that I mentioned just a few min minutes ago, and there were, I think, there were six people that we, we had uh, their, their faces up on the screen. Are you saying that if all, all six of them uh, had some sort of duty to respond here, even if it wasn't, let's say, a purely legal duty, and I don't mean to respond, but to yeah. report, that somehow you believe that they should be culpable, even though there might not be something that we can put our, our fingers on statutorily that says, in a criminal court of law, you're guilty. Now, even the statute is clear about this. So the president Spaniard, we start at the top. Did he know about it? No. Did he get to know about it? We don't know. Right? He wasn't in the, any of the events. But his subordinate, one might say, assistant coach McQuarry, let's believe the facts as they're reported in the, in the grand jury presentment. McQuarrie came upon an event. He tells his boss, Paterno. Paterno says, we got to tell the athletic director because, in fact, in higher education, the AD is, is the man. They tell the athletic director. You have to imagine that the athletic director, when he tells his vice president, tells the president. Now, all those people in that chain of command knew. We don't even have to ask how many people in their offices knew. We, we, uh, it, there's reason to believe that the local police force, that people on, in, in that circle um, had, had knowledge. Each of those persons acquired the duty to report under the law and clearly acquired a moral duty to respond to stop this from happening again. Uh, that's the problem here, that the morality, the ethics, the protecting Penn State's name, to protect the corporate name, to protect the people that you're friends with, became more important than protecting children. And that we get that, but how does that how does that translate into criminal prosecution and to civil liability and some of these large numbers that some lawyers are talking yeah, about? Yeah, we're going to see. We're going to see. Of course, there's a uh, there's a criminal penalty for failure to report. Sadly, it's a summary offense for the first failure and a misdemeanor for second and subsequent. Um, and as the uh, lawyer for the vice president Schultz pointed out, this is little more than a traffic ticket. How can, we, how can we take that sort of penalty seriously? What that's telling us is that, that the penalty setting describes to some extent the priority we place or don't place on these. Uh, that's, why they, uh, uh, that's why these fellows are charged with the failure to report as summary. They get them on perjury because McQuarrie convinced the grand jury that he did indeed give them sufficient facts that would have caused their, their duty to report. They in turn said, well, no, he didn't tell us anything. He just gave us general information. And that leads to civil liability for damages. Right. And I think ultimately uh, there, you'll see a lot of uh, issues about how much in civil damages. And the question is where to try this case. You know, I, I frankly, Judge, don't know that the case should be tried in Center County. I think there's too many people that have connections to Penn State. Uh, and ultimately, the trial may be needed to be moved to a major city like Philadelphia or Pittsburgh or, I know you're, I wouldn't say eerie, but, <laughs> but, but you know, these are things that... So you're worried from almost a prosecutorial stand, uh, standpoint that you're not going to get a fair trial, not from the defense standpoint. No, no, standpoint. from a civil, civil damage side. And also civil, civil damage. damage. Well, right. what we do is okay. we, we uh, take a jury from out of Center County and impanel somebody from Washington County or, or some other county and bring them into Center County for the trial. Uh, in terms of moving, I, I think one, I would like to make a point, Frank has mentioned this about a summary event. Uh, the, the idea of a summary crime uh, is such that it is nothing much more than a traffic ticket for which a citation would be issued. Uh, but you still have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, the charge of perjury, however, is not that easy to prove. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a major felony, and I think it's a, a felony of the third degree. You go to jail for five, five to ten years if you're found guilty of it, and it's very difficult to prove and, and has to be corroborated. It can't be just uh, McQuarrie's word against Curley's word or anything like that. It, it's, a, it's a major issue, and, uh, and it's a tough thing to prove. So. Uh, from the criminal point of view, going up the chain of command uh, is probably not in the cards for anyone, and I'm not sure that the, uh, the perjury charge is really worthwhile. 
We have uh, two judges with us tonight, one a current judge, another one a, a former judge or one that is retired from the bench. And you'll probably be able to answer this one, Judge Cohn. So let's go ahead and take it. It's from Barbara. Uh, Barbara, you've got a question about uh, the judge who failed to recuse herself? Yes. Yes. What's your question? Yes. Go ahead. Fire away. Okay. My question is, uh, the media said that not only did the judge volunteer for the second mile, but she also donated money to the second mile. Now, to me, that seemed to be a conflict of interest. So why did she not, before she set um, unsecured bail for him, recuse herself from the case? That's a great question. And, Judge, you had to figure that uh, this judge in, in central Pennsylvania knew this was going to come out. Bad choice, right? Well, this is a, the district justice handled the matter probably. Uh, no, not, there's no probability about it. She didn't handle it well. She should have uh, disclosed her relationship with the defendant and asked for another judge to come in and handle it. Uh, the but the district district justice, the magistrate, the magisterial justice and the magisterial district for Center County uh, would have had to go outside the county to deal with this particular arrest. And, and her job was to set bail in this matter. Uh, I don't believe that anyone really criticized uh, seriously uh, the bail issue uh, concerning that he was a member of the community for long standing for a long time and no priors, uh, but that she should have disclosed that she's close to the, uh, to the charity for which the, the, the defendant founded. And under those circumstances, clearly should have asked for someone else to come in. I, uh, Steve, your, your uh, eyes uh, um, got you as big know, as saucers. Uh, <laughs> the Cohen problem is the type of offense that this was, and uh, uh, this didn't, you know, he didn't stop being a pedophile before he did it for many years. Uh, we know f uh, from the grand jury that in 2008 and 9, uh, he was still doing the same thing. So letting him out on bail and putting the community at risk is one of the factors that goes into setting bail. Of course, you want to make sure a person is innocent till proven guilty, but this looks pretty pretty dangerous to let this guy out on uh, under those conditions. I don't know whether they put a... Uh, a collar on his leg or some kind of monitoring or bracelet, some sort of bracelet. bracelet. Right. Uh, I'm but not that, sure, but I'd be very nervous well, no, that, about that having him in the presence of any children. Right. That wasn't ordered uh, either. Judge, do you think, Judge Pinello, do you think that that Pennsylvania has what it needs when it comes to mandatory reporting? We're getting all sorts of different reports in the press that, you know, Pennsylvania is one of 18 states in the country that doesn't have a ubiquitous mandatory reporting mm -hmm. law, if I can understand this. And I think Senator Casey has even been mentioning, we really need a federal law. And I know that there are some states' rights people are not uh, real crazy about that. But, and again, you may have to opine here, and I'm, you may have to take another pass here, but does Pennsylvania have everything, is it, does Pennsylvania have everything it needs when it comes to, to mandatory reporting, or do you, do you suspect we're going to see some changes in those laws? You know, well, do I we think, need to beef them I up I think I can bit? answer your question right, this way. Uh, the legislature has been very responsive when it comes to uh, crimes of sexual abuse and crimes against children. The Child Protective Service Law was, of course, adopted many, many years ago and has been amended many times. Of course, the Child Protective Service Law includes mandated reporters, those who are in different types of jobs, employments, professions in which they come in contact with children. If they observe, it's a very low standard, very low. Uh, mm -hmm. If they have reasonable cause to suspect child abuse, they have to report it to either their immediate superior, the administrator, the administrator has to immediately call Childline. And there's even a higher level of reporting if it's a student that is being abused. Then they have to go straight to law enforcement. In the other situation... And it could be a college student. We're not talking about a child of tender years here. It could be a college student, uh, someone under the age of 18 in, right. in, in that regard. Okay. But um, a, a higher requirement of reporting to go directly to law enforcement rather than permit the Children and Youth Division mm -hmm. to go to law mm -hmm. enforcement. I think it's going to be debated for quite some time now as to whether the, the law is sufficient or not and protects everyone adequately. Uh, let me uh, pose that same question to Frank Cervone. Again, this is, uh, this is right up your, your legal alley. Frank, what do you think of the laws? Do you think they're going to change? Should they change? We'd like to see a comprehensive review of the laws. The, the duty to report mechanisms, while they're, they're clear to those of us in the business, are entirely opaque and confusing to the rest of the world, as, as so much of the coverage and public response uh, has been showing over these past few weeks. We'd like to see a study, measured response. Uh, 
across the state capitol these days, it feels like every other legislator is writing his or her own small piece of the bill. There's been talk mm -hmm. of a commission. We've been calling for a commission to look uh, across the spectrum of child abuse cases, uh, young children, uh, sex abuse cases. Uh, the, the other area that we've, we've touched upon is this hierarchy that I get to tell my boss. This is a valid response under Pennsylvania law. Uh, many states don't make for this mechanism. There's some wisdom to it uh, that uh, you, know, you want the janitor to have to make the call rather than to work with somebody in his institution. The key there, that the institution should not be permitted to conduct its own investigation, should not be permitted to ask any of the questions that the mandated reporter himself was not allowed to ask. The moment you suspect, you have an immediate duty to report. You see in the case of Penn State, they took a week to even talk to McQuery. It's unclear whether they ever talked to any of the victims. There's certainly no report of that. And in the end, it appears that no report was made. We have hardly any time left, Steve. I want to give us, give us a forecast. What do you think is going to happen, at least civilly, in this matter? Well, I think there'll be major lawsuits filed. <clears throat> whether or not they'll be moved out of the Center County or not depends. Uh, there'll be damages. There'll be necessary treatment. One of the things Penn State has done that I think is good is they've established a fund to help these kids be treated and uh, there's no requirement of a release or anything like that so that the children and their parents will know there is some place where they can get proper treatment irregardless of uh, since most of these things aren't covered by health insurance. And more importantly what I'd like to see is a complete review of the whole idea of protecting big entities like Penn State like corporations and I'd like to see them look at beyond this is a child abuse for example to give children antipsychotic medications particularly when the decisions to do that are based on uh, studies which are paid for by the drug and that's, industry. And, and that's, I and that's the next that. program. Mm -hmm. uh, for all of us here at the American Law Journal, we're here every Monday night dispensing legal information until next Monday night. For all of us here, case closed. Good night now. This week's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Blank Rome, providing strategic advice for employers in today's workplace. King Spry, serving its Pennsylvania clients in family law, business, personal injury, and school law for over 30 years. Beatty, Sloan, and DeGeneva, personal attention for those hurt at work or suffering from serious injury. Leventhal, Sutton, and Gornstein, we have your social security disability case covered. Martin Banks, we wrote the book on workers' comp law. Einhorn Harris, a long-standing community law firm with the largest family law practice in New Jersey. Polanski and Polanski, former U.S. government counsel, representing those seeking social security disability benefits. Hahalis and Canupas, representing employees wronged at work. Scheller PC, protecting consumer rights since 1977 and the Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal newspaper for lawyers.